Um, hopefully it will be useful for many people around the world. So thank you for joining us today. Um, I wish it was uh, a much um, happier topic that we were talking about. Many of you would have seen in the press over recent weeks, um, the initial, uh, let's say, detention and arrest of uh, Navid Afkafari in Iran. Many of you, probably like me, would have mistakenly believed, and I certainly did, mistakenly believed that he would be released because the sporting community around the world, because he was an athlete, but more importantly, he was a human being. And if, like me, you don't believe that people should be executed, you thought that the world sports community would step up and prevent his execution. It is regretful that they did not, and that did not happen. Therefore, we have put this webinar together as part of uh, a wave of initiatives that are taking place to try to ensure that his death was not in vain. I'm not gonna give a further introduction other than uh, welcoming our speakers who are far better placed to talk on this issue. First up, we have Sally Roberts. She is the founder and CEO of Wrestled Like a Girl. Um, she was an elite wrestling champion and a combat veteran. Wrestle Like a Girl's mission is to empower girls and women using the sport of wrestling to become leaders in life. She was, importantly for today's session, proactively involved in the campaign for the release for Navid. Next up, we have Rob Quel 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 uh, sorry, Rob, I said I wouldn't get it wrong, who's a Director General of Global Athlete. Global Athlete is a non, for those of you who don't know, is a non-profit organisation that champions a bottom-up approach whereby the athletes determine and dictate what needs to change and the best ways of achieving that change. Again, they've been heavily uh, involved in the campaigning around uh, Naveed's death. Next up, we have Brendan Schwab, Executive Director of the World Players Association. Brendan has more than 25 years leadership experience in the governance, business, legal, player relations and human rights aspects of elite sports at a global, regional and national level. He has united the world's leading player association who collectively represent 85,000 athletes to champion the dignity of the player and the humanity of sport. Sally, um, thank you for joining us today and giving up your time to do this. Um, you were involved in campaigning uh, for the release of Naveed. Can you give some background for those people who aren't aware? Can you provide some background into sort of your involvement and detail what happened about the allegations around his arrest, that, that caused his arrest, and then his uh, execution? Sure. Thank you so much for having me, Sean. Uh, Naveed Afkari, he is a Greco Roman national champion from Iran. And there was a time where he had Olympic aspirations in 2018 because of the dire economic circumstances that, that are, existed and still exist in Iran. He put those dreams aside and he became a laborer. The interesting thing about both wrestling and being a laborer is that in Iran that represents the working class. And so that was the voice that he was carrying. In 2018, there was a leaderless organic uprising where people took to the streets to protest these dire economic conditions. He had been arrested along with he and his two brothers. So while they were being held, um, a year had since passed and there was a second wave of these leaderless organic uprisings protesting the dire economic conditions. Um, through the first through the first protest, there were 500, it was uh, reported by Amnesty International, 500 protesters had been killed. The second wave of protests that were November of 2019, 1,500 and counting protesters had been killed. And what the Iranian regime did not want is to continue to have these uprisings. So they already had Mr. Navid Afkari in jail, and he was the embodiment of everything that the regime wanted to quiet. They did not want the working class. They did not want the people to rise up against and say that they deserved better. They wanted everything to be cool because they had things that they had to manage outside of their country and it was becoming too challenging for them to manage it within their country as well. So that brings us to Navid Afkari. He, he was a wrestler. He was a Greco-Roman wrestler in the country of Iran wrestling is a cherished and beloved sport and it is considered one of the most honorable things that you can do. So what the Iranian regime did was they pulled him, they said that he had spoken out against the supreme leader 
And they also had charged him with murdering um, a water security man, which would be considered a plain clothes person. That's someone that goes and sits on the street and just writes down names and takes pictures and sends those to the Iranian regime, to the security forces, so that they can go and get apprehended later. Navid was in prison for 50 days with this new charge, and every day he was being tortured. And after day 50, he had confessed on TV that he had in fact murdered the water security man. And during those 50 days, they also had tortured his two brothers, Habib and Vahid, in saying that, yes, our brother did kill this water security man. Well, what Navid represented was freedom of oppression, freedom of expression, freedom of peaceful assembly. And these are the things that the Iranian regime did not want. So he had been found guilty of both of the charges. And in, in the Sharia law, if you are found guilty of um, and, and sentenced to double, with one execution, you can appeal. With a double execution, there is no appeal. It is, you go directly to, you go down that path. So when I got involved, I sit at the intersection of gender equality, wrestling, and human rights. I got a dossier that came across my desk that said this was the individual, he had just been sentenced, and that we needed to have some vocal support. Before I had any confirmation whether he was guilty or innocent, the first thing that I did was reach out to my sport and human rights colleague, Brendan Robb, and I also reached out to some other colleagues that work in human rights in Iran, and I asked them to please do a very deep and specific dive into this case. And from that point, while all of that was happening, I made a very bold decision to create a video of appeal to, at the very least, I wanted the Iranian government to know that I wanted them to give a stay of execution. And the audacity in all of that was that as I was doing my background research and getting the facts, I had gotten informed that the Iranian regime, they do not forgive and they do not forget. And I thought if I'm getting that message and I'm sitting here in the United States and I am a white woman that has all the privilege in the world, imagine what is happening to Navid Afkari who had been wrongfully sentenced to double execution. And I opted to make the decision to step into the light and become a voice and sound the alarm that an athlete is being persecuted for using his platform to speak out against oppression. And it's such an important point at this moment in time, given the Black Lives Matter movement, given all the stuff around Rule 50 and process Olympic Games is such a pertinent issue. And you know, we were talking about this yesterday and listening to you describe what happened and how it happened. Um, you know, you, it really hit home about that privilege that we do have you know, that we have the privilege that we can speak up against people, our politicians who we don't agree with, our employers who we don't agree with, and when none of us are fearing uh, for our lives. Um, what was, how did you um, react then to when you received that sort of heads up, right, that they do not forgive and do not forget? How did that make you feel and how did you react and how did, did that change how you uh, liaise with colleagues who may not be in such a privileged position? My, my immediate reaction when I heard that statement was that I had chills that went up my spine. And I thought, okay, if this is an avenue of approach that I'm going to pursue, that I need to be strategic. I have to use logic. I have to use my colleagues that are experts in this space. And I have to go forward with bravery and courage. And through that whole process, I found that we have some valiant human rights defenders. And I found that there's people that want to become there. We have those first waves that come on board initially. And then we start to get those follow on leaders that come on because they, they see that, well, now that you've shown that this is the right thing, I'm willing to get on board. But it truly was that leap of faith as a humanity to say, this is the direction that we need to go. And this is the direction that I'm going to go, whether you be there or not. And one of the things that I've always told the athletes that I represent in Wrestle Like a Girl is, if you are an athlete, if you are an activist, if you are using your voice and speak out and anything happens to you, call me and I will come to your aid. And though Navid had never asked for me to come to his aid, I treated him and respected him just as I would any other athlete that would fall underneath my umbrella. Thank you. And Rob, uh, 
obviously you're heavily involved with the athlete community. How have the athletes that you've been liaising with reacted to this? Yeah, I, <clears throat> thanks, Sean. I mean, when Sally uh, raised the issue to us and, and with us, uh, along with Brendan and World Players, well, I think we took the same action as, as Sally and, you know, what, has she, what she has done to raise light on this issue at a very early time we felt that we had no other option but to inform and educate the athlete community of, of what exactly what was happening with NEVID. So we reached out in the very few day, very few days, hundreds of athletes and athlete groups, um, informed them about what was happening and the possible execution of a human and, and a wrestler, uh, an athlete in Iran for basically peaceful protesting. The reaction from the athletes was swift, um, was a demand for change and demand that there should be a stay of execution for, for NAVID. It was interesting to get a different approach from different athlete groups. And I think it's the sign of what we're seeing globally and within our community. Is some were very willing to speak out openly, some were afraid to speak up because of the potential fear of retribution and some were afraid to even address the issue because um, it was dealing with, with Iran and human rights. But in the end, athletes did rally to the challenge. Athletes did speak up and asked for a stay of execution. And one of the things that was disheartening, but maybe not surprising, was the athletes said, why is it always us demanding change? Why is it always us coming forward and demanding a better sport? And where's the International Olympic Committee and international sport in calling for Iran to stop the execution of Navid, for Iran to have consequences should they execute Navid? This was one of the things athletes were very disappointed with, that the IOC and the international sporting movement did not publicly go out and condemn any of these actions. Yes, they said they were working behind the scenes, but they wanted to see a public announcement. And athletes really felt that if the IOC and the Olympic movement was not going to stand up and publicly support Navid, who was on death row to be executed, where are they going to stand on other human rights issues when it comes to protecting athletes and protecting rights? So we encourage the athletes to be vocal. We encourage them to, to support the, the initiative that Sally was running in terms of saving Navid's life. Unfortunately, we, we, did, we weren't successful. But I think as Brennan said very clearly that we weren't gonna leave Navid's name in vain. And we were going to continue. And athletes after the execution of, of Navid became more, I would say, together, used a voice and wanted to demand the International Olympic Committee to take action. And some of the actions that we've seen have been pretty disheartening. I think when you have the Vice President of the International Olympic Committee, John Coates, clearly state that there's two sides to the story as to whether he, Navid, got a fair go or didn't. Navid was executed, Navid was tortured, Navid did not get a fair go. And that's where athletes are calling on the International Olympic Committee to not only talk about peace, humanity, human rights, two weeks of the year or three weeks of the year during the Olympic Games, but for it to be an ongoing discussion for them to stand up and to support and promote and protect athletes. That is their role if they're going to take on a peace through sport objective. So from an athlete's perspective, they've been very clear. Some have been more vocal than others that sanctions need to be placed, people need to be made accountable, and athletes are humans first, athletes second, and they need to be protected. Athletes will continue to be vocal on this, we continue to have the discussion, and they want to see change from a bigger and, picture and from, and from the Navid's picture. And how does the, is there a differing opinion about sanctions? Because one of the things that comes up, and I know that we talked about this uh, on a previous occasion, um, from the athletes who are in Iran, the wrestling athletes who are in Iran, and those athletes who are outside of it, 
is there a differing view on sanctions? Because one of the concerns, and I know that we've got a mentoring group and in the chat, some of my, my colleagues in the mentoring group were having this debate, uh, or at least talking about this debate, which is like, are sanctions actually effective? And who does it affect? What's the general feel between the wrestling athletes or if you're in contact with them uh, in Iran and those who are outside of Iran? Is there a differing opinion or is it, is it all aligned in terms of they think there should be sanctions? Maybe Sally would be the best person. I know she's been in contact with, with the Iranian athletes from, from, from that perspective, but from a general international athlete's perspective, um, I think everyone has been united in one thing is that Iranian sport needs to be sanctioned for this. The only difference of opinion, which I think is now um, universally accepted is the athletes shouldn't have to suffer, uh, but the, the officials themselves and sport. But Sally does have some insight on, on the Iranian athletes, so I'll pass it to her. You're up. Sally. Yeah, we, we've actually been in conversation and about 90% of the Iranian athletes, they've expressed that they want to see justice for Navid. And if they have to be the group that suffers because that is the way that they're going to get justice for Navid and change the system going forward, they're, they're not opposed to it. If there is an opportunity for uh, a neutral flag that they can go underneath, they're, they're open to that as well. There is a strong majority that are not thrilled to be competing underneath the Iranian clerical regime's flag because they find that if they're not winning and they're not successful, they're getting these negative, if, if, if not portraits, second and third order effects. And you can actually go back and look at the last Olympic. 53 of their athletes defected out of Iran because of their treatment. And so this is clearly a systemic issue that we're looking at. This, this raises such a good point, though. That I haven't even thought about that in terms of defections from countries, that, that in terms of what happened. That's a whole you know, a related point. But at what point does, does the sport movement have to start recognizing when you have 53 defections from a country that something's not quite right? Right. At what point does that, you know, you think if there was one, two, that would cause a bit of attention. 53, you think there should be an inquiry um, into why that's happening and what action should be taken. Um, absolutely fascinating to, to hear. And, 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 and rightly so, um, I think Siobhan, I think she put a comment to, to us panelists. I think you meant to do it to everyone, but said brave people. And I, I wholeheartedly agree with that. That is a very uh, bold and selfless approach from the athletes in Iran, I have to say. Um, Brendan, from your perspective, listening to all this, what would you say then is the option? You know, we talk to, you know, often sanctions becomes the point of debate, but is there any other action that should be taken uh, in terms of reforms that would ensure that this situation does not occur again, or at least makes uh, it much more difficult to occur? Well, <clears throat> well as you know, Sean, um, we've been working very hard um, through world players and international sports and human rights community to embed uh, human rights in sport. Uh, Brendan, sorry to interrupt you. I don't think your headset is connected because normally we can hear your voice perfectly. Now, there's a bit of an echo in the background and I think it's because the headset is not um, on the mic. Sorry to interrupt you. No, that's okay. I just thought it would be important to, because I know normally when we've done this, you've got such a clear voice. <laughs> is that better, Sean? Uh, I don't think so. Maybe it just be the room you're in maybe, but I think... How's that? A little, it's normally just a little bit clearer. It might be if you go to the, the bottom left and to the microphone. Um, just check if your headset that's actually connected. Just because normally it's a bit clearer. Mm -hmm. said, sorry, sorry to interrupt you on that point. So as, as you're doing that, I'll just read out. Um, as I said, when you for those of you who have just joined, if you do want to introduce yourself, if you have any comments, please do put your comments into the chat. Um, you know, I know that again, Shabon's writing some questions, some points in there about a neutral flag would be great way to compete. Um, you know, and 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 show their protest against the Iranian state and the the, con the, the treatment of Navid. Um, if you do have any questions for the panelists, please do use the Q&A feature. Likewise, if you do have your hand up, I'll come to you if you do want to ask any questions. Brendan, if, it, if it's not working, that's fine. We can, we can hear you okay, uh, okay, but it's just I know that you normally have a high quality microphone. Well, we'll give it one more try. How's that, Sean? 
Uh, I think it's just the echo in maybe in, in the room. It doesn't sound, or maybe we can come on to it. We'll just listen to you and then we can try and fix it in, when one of the other speakers are speaking. Okay. Any, any better with that? A little bit better, yeah, actually. That is okay. Okay. Um, yeah, look, thanks for that. I'm sorry for the technological uh, problems. Um, I think I might just take a step back uh, before we talk to the specific question of, of sanctions, because that can only ever be part of uh, a, much, a much bigger discussion. Uh, World Players was first involved in this um, on the 2nd of September. So unfortunately, that was only 10 days uh, before the execution. Indeed, when we first got involved, it was only a week before the proposed uh, date for the um, execution of, of, of Navid. Um, we had previous experience with this in two ways. The first was we had been part of a big movement to embed human rights in sport. Uh, that sport would actually uh, back up with action, systemic action, the very high rhetoric that often surrounds, particularly global sport, that uh, around sport being a force for good. And that discussion was necessary because there'd been a litany of human rights um, abuses in the name of sport, particularly in and around mega sporting events, um, which, which reached a tipping point with the revelations of the abuse of migrant workers in Qatar. It was that, at that point that governments and brands and others said we can no longer justify our involvement with sport if it's going to be associated with such um, human rights harms. Um, that did start a big movement and it resulted in FIFA and others making very strong statutory and policy commitments to human rights in accordance with the United Nations guiding principles on business and human rights. And that's important because they say that sports as big businesses do have a responsibility in relation to human rights. It's not just a matter for governments. This is not just a matter for the state of Iran. And so the question for a body such as United World Wrestling or the International Olympic Committee is, are they causing or contributing to this harm or are they linked with it? They're not causing or contributing to this harm. I think we acknowledge that. But they are linked with it because this is the targeting of an athlete who's participated in peaceful protest because of the profile of the athlete to be made an example of. And so therefore the sports have leverage, they have the capacity to exercise great leverage over governments because of the in incredible respect and power that the international sports community has. The case was very similar to that with the Bahraini refugee Hakim al Arabi, who of course, as you know, he's just become a father, Sean, just in the last couple of weeks. And so there's been a really great response to, to, to his situation. But he was facing extradition back to uh, Bahrain last year for very similar circumstances. He was involved in peaceful protest in 2011 and 12 against the Bahraini regime as part of the Arab Spring. And in, in that circumstance, some 150 athletes were arrested by the regime, detained and tortured, partly in order to be made um, an example of. Um, we were able, to, under the incredible leadership of, of Craig Foster, uh, the former Socceroos or Australian soccer captain, but also the broader community, the Centre for Sport and Human Rights, coordinating the governments, the brands and others, uh, to make it clear to FIFA that it does need to exercise its leverage to make sure that Hakim al Arabi, as a football player, is not extradited to Bahrain, but returned safely from detention in Thailand back to Australia where he had been um, granted asylum. FIFA in that case was very reluctant to talk about um, sporting sanctions on Bahrain or indeed um, Thailand. When we met with Fatma Samura, the Secretary General of FIFA, she argued that um, sanctions based on her previous experience, even in the United Nations, would be counterproductive, could harm people that um, would be uh, uh, victims, unreasonably so, such as, of course, the athletes who would be denied um, the right to participate. FIFA did say that it was a, 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 an emergency. They elevated it to the highest levels of the football authorities and the Olympic committees in both countries, the governments um, in both countries. But what really saved Hakim 
it must be said, was the power of the people, the power of the athlete community to lobby and get such a social media presence and such a campaign that it be simply became unsustainable for the governments of Thailand and Bahrain to um, um, extradite Hakim. The system did not save Hakim al Arabi. The power of the campaign saved Hakim al Arabi. And here we did not have enough time, despite the incredible efforts of so many. And I must say, our movement galvanised much quicker than it did for Hakim because we learned from it. The movement was unable to save Nabil. The government in this instance was so committed to the execution, was so committed to making the, the public point that it did, that the execution proceeded. And so we have to ask, what is the system that could have saved Navid? And to suggest that, and, and what we understood from the start, was that sport can speak with a more powerful voice here than politics. Um, and so sport has to build a system and if we come back to the case for sanctions and we talk about issues like political interference, the athlete sits at the heart of sport. Here we have a situation where athletes are being targeted because of their profile as athletes. And we know that Navid is innocent. We know that the, there was an appalling and shocking abuse of process in order to um, uh, secure his, his conviction. So uh, we have to make sure the system works. And so our commitment, we've not been able to save the vid. That was our objective. Our commitment now is to make sure we bring about the systemic change that we wanted to bring about in relation to Hakim. There still hasn't been an investigation into what happened in 2011 and 12 in Bahrain. There certainly at a minimum has to be an investigation to find out whether Navid's status as an athlete contributed to his execution. And as we speak, Sean, you mentioned before about Black Lives Matter and so on, and we're seeing an incredible wave of athlete activism. As we speak in Belarus, there's a new emerging group called the Free Union of Athletes who are also going to speak out for social justice and speak out for democracy in their country. And they may well be vulnerable. So the Olympic movement and everyone involved in sport it's not just the Olympic movement, it's for everyone to ask themselves these questions. What can we do to bring about this systemic change so that athletes who speak up for human rights can be safe? Whilst, um, thank you, Brendan. And whilst uh, undoubtedly an investigation report would be enlightening and helpful and action could be taken from it, we all know the risk uh, of sometimes over-reliance on these type of reports, right? Because they may not actually lead to anything happening. However, who would be in your mind then the competent body to do an investigation? Is it the, an ethics committee or the IOC? Is it, who, who, who is it? And if not, should there be a body that is responsible for this? Is it something the Center for Sport and Human Rights picks up? Who would be the, 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 the body that would do a report that would have enough significance that it would help evoke more change? Well, the IOC has a responsibility to be able to know and show that statements that it is making are accurate. So Rob referred before to the comment uh, from John Coates, the Vice President, that there are two sides to the story. Well, there's five special rapporteurs from the United Nations Human Rights High Commissioner's Office that have made it clear that he was targeted as an athlete and the abuse of process was appalling that he was tortured and the only evidence against it was a confession obtained under torture. So the information is, is already available in a highly, highly credible way. Um, the Centre for Sport and Human Rights would be well placed to do it, but I do believe that it would require also the support of the Olympic movement. This needs to be well resourced. It's one of the things we've called back, uh, we've called for. It needs to go back to look at the situation in Bahrain um, and uh, it should involve all sports bodies because it's not just wrestlers or Olympic athletes but certainly footballers and others who have been involved. Um, the sponsors and the brands should be interested in it but the beauty of the centre undertaking such a thing in partnership with uh, the UN Office of High Commission for Human Rights is that we have independence and clearly independence and expertise are two key criteria that would make such a, a process um, um, worthwhile. Um, 
so we've got some questions and I think it's probably appropriate moment in time to take them. Um, so we've got one from, and I apologies if I get anyone's name wrong, <laughs> uh, Ruby Ann Kagegonan, oh, apologies. Um, how do we use the Tokyo Olympics to protest Navid's execution? Does, uh, would anyone like to take that? You know, given the, the, the all of the discussion around Rule 50 and the Black Lives Matter movement and and so forth, would anyone, you know, I guess it could be, you could say the Tokyo Games or you could say, you know, any sporting event for that matter, but particularly the Olympic Games. Is it is there, can that be used to cause I mean, a change, Rob? Sean, I think uh, to take a step back is, again, we talk about athlete activism and <clears throat> athletes standing up. Uh, I don't want to see we, us wait till the Tokyo 2021 games to come to grips with what happened with Navid and for the Olympic movement and international, the United World Wrestling Federation to, to take action and to, to really ensure that Navid and his, his life being taken doesn't go in vain. And they have a, they have a, a, a right a responsibility to ensure that the message is strong, sent, strongly sent to Iran and any other country that is an abuse of human rights towards athletes. And we shouldn't have to rely on athletes taking a podium protest in, in honor of, of Navid. So I would like to see in advance of that, um, people, the IOC taking action now. And it goes to the whole things where, and, and someone raised in the question about sponsors. I think sponsors have a responsibility here as well. Sponsors are fueling this industry where the protection and the human rights towards athletes is atrocious in a lot of places. We're seeing more abuse in sport than ever before, whether it's being exposed or it's, it's always been happening, but it's, it's there, it's now. So we need sponsors to put pressure on the Olympic movement, to demand more accountability, and to see the Olympic movement embed human rights into the charter. And if you do that, we avoid situations that we've seen with this horrific incident with Navid. And athletes deserve to be protected. And I'll end that with how the Thomas Bach is being awarded Peace Prize in Korea because of his work during the Tokyo, during the Pyeongchang Games. The Olympic movement has a responsibility to uphold human rights 365 days a year, not every three weeks. And I think it, that's where we need to focus on. And would it be, you know, the problem is, it seems to me, that, that one of the challenges is that sport is almost instricably linked with politics, right? And as much as the Olympic movement and FIFA and other organizations try to say that politics isn't welcome in sport, inevitably when you involve governments in, 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 in any capacity hosting the games, politics comes into play. From what Brendan and, and, and Sally and Rob and what you've all said, it would seem to me that in some ways, having a clear and transparent structure in terms of a process to deal with a situation like this would alleviate the political tensions, right? So I think, Brendan, when we spoke, you said this, you know, we were just talking about this and you said, Sean, you're overcomplicating the issue here. The solution is simple. And, I, and maybe you want to describe that because for me, sure. I thought it, was, it was very uh, an effective analysis. Sure. Well, look, you know, we do have a very clear framework. It's called the United Nations Guide of Principles on Business and Human Rights. It's the accepted standard and it's that basis which has informed the development of human rights uh, within FIFA, the Commonwealth Games Federation and others. And in fairness to the International Olympic Committee, it's given a commitment to do that. It's taking a long time because the crisis in Qatar was just so engulfing. FIFA had to act with urgency. But we're seeing human rights now abuses on a regular and systematic basis. And the problem is people don't have standing to bring about a response. Um, we're still waiting for the International Olympic Committee and others to take action. The victims of human rights abuse need standing to access a remedy. And that is really the missing element in, in, in all of this. Who can trigger action to ensure that there's um, access to a remedy. You know, can, uh, if we look at uh, Iran at the moment, obviously the human rights concerns here go well beyond uh, the, the, the capricious use of, of the death penalty. Uh, it's a very gendered uh, 
um, society and it, for many years it has implemented a ban on women attending stadia to watch uh, men's football matches. Uh, it, the FIFA has long been warned that women activists will be placing themselves in grave danger through their peaceful protest. A year ago, um, a legendary woman now, who's now known as the Blue Girl, Saha Konayari, because of her support for the team Eshtagal, a big team in Tehran, she was facing yet again another period of imprisonment um, by reason of uh, trying to attend a match, by reason of participating in protests, and she tragically set herself on fire at the court and passed away by reason of her injuries. The women in Iran were never given standing to enforce FIFA's rules that prohibit gender discrimination. People had to wait for a political response. Had the women been given standing, then that rule would have been enforced because in many ways it was a black and white case of, of, of gender discrimination. So, so, so Brendan, so in this situation, you, so I think PATH has touched on the question that PATH uh, Meta has, has raised about like, should there be this fundamental principle across sport in which you say, this is what we accept and this is what we don't accept across the board, it's black and white. If this happens, you have a mechanism in which, as you would say, you could achieve a remedy, right? You could go to FIFA and say, this is not happening uh, you know, we're not being given access and then there'll be an effective remedy taken by that international federation. Because it, oh, it's, it, 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 it's not really necessarily by the federation. It needs to be an independent process. But the, the issue is that the affected people, be it the athletes, be it the fans, be it the local communities where the stadia are being constructed for a mega sporting event, these affected voices need to be taken into account and be given legitimacy in order to make sure that these decisions can take place. Sport can conduct itself in a way where it upholds its responsibility to respect human rights. Now, often it's not black and white. We, we, we acknowledge that. But when we're dealing with two very basic enabling rights here, freedom of expression, freedom of association, it relatively is uh, black and white and of course these are two great enabling rights which the sports bodies are still having great difficulty in coming to terms with. Um, now what the IOC and others need to understand is if they seek to hinder those rights you can't contain them because courageous people are standing up for social justice. We've seen it with the NBA players, the NFL players. We're seeing it in Belarus. We've seen it in Bahrain. We've seen it in Iran. And what concerns us as a global movement is the more visibility that is given to these courageous acts of peaceful protest, which are resulting in reforms, such as social justice agreements, which are going to elevate political access, for example, in the United States in the lead up to the election. This visibility also raises and increases the concerns of the repressive regimes. And so athletes in these regimes are placing themselves in graver danger, as we're seeing as we speak in Iran and Belarus. Thank you, Brendan. Uh, we've got a question from Anton Klizhwetsky. Um, the Iranian Olympic Committee was condemning the decision of the government and was trying to advocate for a fair trial and collaboration with the um, NGOs and the athletes. How can the IOC and the sporting world cooperate with the Iranian Olympic Committee from now on whilst making it clear to sanction Iran? Sally, did you want to take that? Well, I think, the, I think the interesting thing is, is that from the information that I had received, and I believe Robin Brendan heard the same thing, was that they were having um, both the Iranian National or the Iranian Olympic Committee and the Iranian Wrestling Federation were having these closed door private meetings where we, we didn't find out about it until afterward. And so the, the challenge that we were having was that how, how do we support them if we don't know that these meetings are being had and how do we support them if what they're doing is these closed door private meetings. 
Um, so that was a little bit of a challenge for me to understand how we were supposed to work with them when we, I was being a complete open book. Here's the information that I have. Here's the direction that it's going. Here is the urgency that Amnesty International and they would, you know, they would just say, well, it's a very delicate process and, and we must be slow. And so that was, um, I think figuring out a way to get someone to be um, more open with the conversation and maybe that's getting someone that actually works human rights within IOC or the International Wrestling Federation, if not maybe every international federation, but we have to start getting people that want to be on the team and want to work with us because mm. that's when we're truly going to be effective is when we're all one team going the same direction with the same goal in mind. And that's when our sporting opportunities are going to prosper. That's when the sponsors are going to get more of a benefit. That's when the athletes are going to be proud to be a part of every bit of the movement. And do you, can I ask, was there a real and present danger for those people as well, though, on that committee for speaking up in a repressive regime? Say, for example, maybe there were people... I'm going to say, I don't know if this, I don't know what the situation was, but what could it be the case that there were people within the um, National Olympic Committee and the um, National Wrestling Federation who wanted to speak up, maybe wanted to reach out for you, but was were scared and prevented for, and so that's why you know a more formal mechanism through the IOC or the International Federation could also be more effective that way. Is that is that is that a challenge, or is that just uh, my perception of it, or? That, that's the that's accurate. There were three wrestlers from inside of Iran that actually posted, they didn't even say hashtag Navid. They just put up a picture and said, the voices of the people will always come through. And within three hours, not only were their messages taken down, but their Twitter accounts were deleted. And so there is a very real and present danger with athletes from within Iran speaking up. That's why when I reached out to Rob and Brendan, I said, we need to create a stadium war a stadium roar with athletes speaking louder than politics. And it has to be the voices from the athletes on the outside coming in because we have to be able to speak and have a voice for the voiceless. Thank you. I think that's a point of my word. Now, Ellie, uh, Eli, sorry, I got this wrong. Eli Wolf, I think raised, raised your hand. So I'm gonna allow you to talk. Um, so hopefully you could be able to turn your microphone on now. Hi, Eli. Hey, everybody. Good to see you. Thank you so much for this excellent, really important conversation today. Yeah, I had posted the question about the convention, um, just in terms of kind of more legal, hard law, legal human rights instruments. And I guess maybe particularly for Brendan and Rob and, and yourself, um, Sean, of course, um, just kind of the, the hard law instruments that we have. It seems like we're a little bit lacking in that regard um, in the context of sport. Um, and I guess part, part B would be about education. I guess the second part of my question would be about the need for educational resources because the mass majority, you know, there's those of us that are involved, but in order to reach a more mass movement to get to the millions and the hundreds of millions of people engaged, to me, that's an educational question. So love your thoughts. Thank so, you so much. So, 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 so two questions. So you've asked about using international instruments such as the UN uh, uh, Human Rights um another international instrument being question number one and maybe we can take that and then we'll come on to the education point in terms of how do we address that i think it's a great point um thank you very much i'll just mute you for a second <laughs> and you can respond if they uh, if there's anything else you want to raise uh who wants to take that brendan and then yeah yeah i'll have it i'll have a go at that thanks eli and i saw you know i think you may have even been talking about a specific sport and human rights um, convention. There's actually a big discussion at the moment for a binding treaty on business and human rights and we're seeing quite a number of countries, uh, you, the European uh, Union is looking at it now, Switzerland has a, a referendum coming up, there's already a law in France for example uh, that goes some way to binding human rights due diligence which is basically that companies have, are under a proactive duty to make sure that they fully take into account the human rights impacts of their activities in advance so as to prevent and then give them the opportunity to address harm. Um, so that movement's good and that movement will apply to sport um, and we're supporting that. However, I do think sport has a unique power to set the standard for business and human rights uh, because of the incredible global reach of its own private regulation. Now, if we look at the Olympic Charter, 
The fundamental principles include the practice of sport being a human right and that every individual must have the possibility of practicing sport without discrimination of any kind. It then goes on to say that the enjoyment of rights and freedoms in the Olympic Charter um, shall be secured without discrimination on the basis of political or other opinion. So the language is there. The problem is it's, it's not binding. When it comes to this essential question, how can the uh, IOC and others exercise leverage over states which are acting in a capricious way to deny athletes these fundamental rights? Um, the issue is that the leverage does have to go beyond the behind the scenes, quiet diplomacy, which is absolutely has a role to play, which is um, respected, and look at the question of leverage through sanctions. Now, under the United Nations guiding principles, an effective remedy legitimately can include punitive sanctions. And in preparing for this uh, webinar, and we've looked at this closely, here are some examples of sporting sanctions in recent times because of so-called autonomy of sport questions or interference by governments in sport. South Korea is presently under investigation because it's trying to address, with, address corruption and abuse. In the last, that's by the IOC in the last decade or so, India, Ghana, Panama and Kuwait have all been sanctioned. South Korea, Sri Lanka has been threatened. Yesterday, Trinidad and Tobago was sanctioned because the local courts tried to uh, govern over uh, the imposition of a FIFA normalisation committee. In the last years, uh, Pakistan, Nigeria, Guatemala, Kuwait, Sudan, Mali and Sierra Leone have all been sanctioned. Now, at no stage did FIFA ask itself or the IOC ask itself, who will be the innocent victims of those sanctions? Will the athletes miss out on the opportunity to participate? Yet when it comes to using those sanctions, not for the reasons of autonomy of sport, but for the humanity of sport, we have a different set of criteria which uh, need to be uh, applied. And that's what really does need to be revisited. The other very interesting sanction at the moment, of course, is the Iranian Judo Federation, uh, because it instructed the athlete Sayyid Malalai to uh, forfeit a match against a Russian opponent because that may have resulted in an Iranian athlete fighting uh, or competing against an Israeli athlete in circumstances where Iran does not recognise Israel. That constituted political interference. So clearly the framework is there. The question is whether that framework is going to be used to deal with human rights violations. We're very confident that if it is, it'll bring about the outcomes that Sally spoke about. The sponsors, the athletes, everyone will involved will know that this sport is genuine, that, that it is living, it, it's, living, it's, it's living the values it, it's pronouncing. So on this, and I want to give Rob and Sally the chance to, to, to input on that. One of the things I find astonishing, I'm not sure if you feel the same, but given all the abuse that we've seen around the world nowadays, and the one thing that I always get concerned and, and surprised about, and I think it's a disgrace, is the fact the, la the, the, the deafening silence, right? The deafening silence about this abuse from the powers that be, because uh, when there was a doping scandal, they set up WADA, right? And in introduced an international framework in which, you know, laboratories are uh, not recognized and sporting federations are not recognized, all because they say they're cheating the system. But when there's systemic abuse of athletes, whether it's sexual abuse, emotional abuse, et cetera, as we're seeing, in, in all the cases that have been documented over recent years, and now the, the, the execution of an athlete, where is, why is there not that response that we saw when, and Rob, obviously you've got a background in anti-doping prior to your work with global athletes, so maybe that's pertinent for you to ask that, answer that question, and maybe you've got a view on it. You know, I don't think I'll dive into the anti-doping aspect, but <laughs> I just wanted to, to really echo something Sally said at the very beginning, and. It's something that someone told me, a close friend of mine, and, and this goes to about changing the sporting environment. And the saying is, if you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. And sport itself likes to play the long game. And all of these issues 
they hope that they will go away and people will go away and new people will come in and these issues will, issues will seem fresh. So I'm addressing both the education aspect that was asked. If we're going to change the world of sport, if we're going to embed human rights, if we're going to ensure that acts that have happened in Iran with the execution of Navid never happen again, we can't rely on people being silent. We need people to be vocal. We need people to demand change. And we need to stand up for those rights. And sitting back and being afraid of retribution is real, but people need to get over that. Because when you bring truth to power, you bring change. And I think moving forward, the, the lawyers, the legal, the legal community, the athlete community, the human rights community constantly needs to have the discussion on what needs to change, needs to have the discussion what's going, what's going wrong and how we bring about a better future for sport. No one wants to hurt sport. We want to see it healthier. We want to, and Sally raised this perfectly, we want to see it healthier. We want to see more buy-in from athletes, to be proud to go to the field, to the, to the mat, to the ice surface every day and, and being a proud member of the community. I don't see, think we're seeing that today. And that's why bringing truth to power, speaking up and demanding change needs to be in everyone's forefront and everyone's language moving forward. Because if we just say, stay silent, we'll never see change. And do you think uh, an athlete was saying to me yesterday that about the fact that when certain things happen, people start to use it for recognition and symbolism as opposed to actual meaningful change. So like sort of sports bodies will jump on the bandwagon as such to say, we saw this with Black Lives Matter, people making various commitments and so forth for a two week period, or you were saying the IOC for a two week period, then it falls away. Um, do we have to keep this message simpler? If you see what I mean, that, that it should be, you know, if sport is about the participants, then primarily the primary driver should be to making sure the participants are looked after. And if that is the number one objective and everyone can abide by that, and if they don't see it happening, it's very clear what the mechanism, is, as Brendan would say, the remedy is very clear who you go to, right? To get, to get redress. Yeah. It's, I mean, Brendan raised it and Sally raised it and I'll, I won't talk any much longer, but it's the whole idea of embedding human rights into the Olympic charter and no longer having sport lawyers, no offense to any sport lawyers on the call, but right, having, just... not, having, not having four lawyers deal with human rights issues, issues mm -hmm. should be human rights experts dealing with human rights issues. Um, there's, okay. a, there's a place in sport for sport lawyers, but there's also a place for human rights experts to deal with such abuses. And, and Sally, you've got a, a, a background obviously in education and empowerment. So did you want to take you know, more broadly about using the instruments, but also to take that point that Eli raised around education? Well, I think that when you're looking at something such as the Navid case, right? I mean, you just have different schools of thought. You have some athletes that they want to speak out and they are terrified because of, what, of all of the unknowns. Maybe they're Iranian and they have family back in Iran and, and they know that the regime is going to target anyone that can hurt them if they use their voice to speak out. You also have people that it's not on their radar for whatever reason. And so part of my job is to be a storyteller and tell them and get them to get emotionally involved and emotionally invested. But, you know, I, I think one of the things that I learned being at this international wrestling, gender equality and human rights space is that the most radical and bold thing I've been able to do is to be morally courageous and ethical. And if I have my agenda and I'm proud and I'm bold and I'm bold with my voice, I'm finding that I get more and more people to sign on because they want to be a part of something that's going to have positive and lasting change. So the question that I often pose is, how do we get more of those athletes to the table? What is going to get them more comfortable? And sometimes it's just that notion that we go through as, as the athlete, part of the experience. We have to get uncomfortable with being uncomfortable. And once we get to that point, we can see that, wow, I've used my voice and I'm still here and I'm still going forward and, and we're still making progress. We can get more and more of these athletes and all the stakeholders and thought leaders on board. So looking at all of it, we need everybody and everyone's gonna be able to give to the capacity that they can. And even if they can't vocally speak out, I know by sometimes just the look in their eye that they're giving me their love and they're giving me their light and they're saying, we can't do it, but we really need you to and we need your friends to follow. 
I think it's a, a fantastic point, and it seems that you know, as, as sports been evolving, and with you know the positive and negatives that come from social media, and the work that the, the, the likes that you are doing, and Brendan and Rob, of giving a voice to athletes in different forums is huge, away from the permitted routes that have existed that, that don't necessarily give the voice to the, the collective, if you see what I mean, or the majority of athletes, uh, just a selected chosen few, particularly in regimes like Iran. Um, we've got three questions. Now, four questions. Um, uh, Stan's Law Droids, um, would, how about strategic litigation and international legal aid for athletes in danger? Maybe more could be done in this area, especially in cooperation with social responsibility litigation funders. Um, have any of you looked at that? In terms, I know you used to talk about, uh, you know, Rob, specialist uh, human rights lawyers. Have you been, have, have any of you looked at that? Well, there's definitely a role for it. You know, if, if we look at, the emergence of our movement, the player association movement. Strategic litigation was critical. Um, free agency would not exist, for example, the rights of players to negotiate their contracts without strategic litigation. Um, tackling the, 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 the anti-competitive behaviour of sports bodies <clears throat> in Europe, for example, has been critical. So there's definitely a role with Hakim's case we took this view that we had to make sure he didn't lose in the Thai court. If the Thai court ordered his extradition, that could have been the end of the matter. So we, we, we did whatever we could to support his legal team, <clears throat> make sure that, that funding would not be a problem. But we also knew that he wasn't gonna win it there as well. And so it had to be part of a much bigger picture and we believe ultimately it required a political solution. But was there systemic change after Hakim? Sheikh Selman, and this goes back to the point about what role the Iranian Federation played, I don't know. We have to look into that. But if we look at Hakim's case, Sheikh Selman, FIFA Vice President, member of the Bahraini ruling family. Prince Nasser, head of the Bahraini National Olympic Committee, member of the Bahraini ruling family. They were the ones who pushed the button on the extradition request. And so that separation is simply, simply not there. The political power is there. Strategic litigation certainly has a role, uh, but it needs to be part of a, of a, bigger, a bigger movement as well. Great. Um, I'm not sure if anyone else wants to do anything to that. If not, I'll go to, I'm going to give, thankfully, Ruby, thank you very much for spelling this out for me. <laughs> Ruby and Ka. Gawan. Hopefully I've got that correct this time. Um, a great point. She says, how can we, pressure then the IOC to embed human rights into the Olympic Charter, building on that point. What is the action that everyone can take to ensure that it is embedded into the Olympic Charter? Rob, do you want to take that or Sally? I can just introduce what we've done with uh, by world players taking the lead is we have put together a, a position paper um, on a fundamental principle of the Olympic Charter, which is really embedding human rights into the Olympic Charter. And I would encourage you to, to look on the World Players website, uh, to download it, and to be, to be a part of demanding change when it comes to um, having the Olympic movement accept these, these, this new principle. It, it's crucial. They've started the process, as Brendan said. Um, but again, it's taking too long and the long game that people end up forgetting. So continue. Is to there a change, change.org or something petition that could be um, set up that people could actively, so rather than just acknowledge it and share it, that they could actually show their support for? Would that be something? And I, would, I would add briefly, one of my one of my colleagues, her name's Minky Worden, she's the International Initiatives Director for Human Rights Watch. She has been in ongoing conversations to get human rights um, embedded into the Olympic Charter. And I know that her and her team at Human Rights Watch, they have been working and it's um, scheduled to go in for the bidding. So all of the host countries that want to bid, you have to have a human rights component. And I know that they're looking at various ways to expand that to ensure that the right of athletes is paramount and throughout the charter. Brilliant. Thank you, Sally. Uh, Brendan? Yeah, just a quick update on that. In, in late 2016, early 2017, um, world players in partnership with Human Rights Watch and others like Amnesty Transparency International, we've formed what's called the Sport and Rights Alliance. So the host city contract from the Olympic Games from 2024 
does make these commitments. Interestingly, the host city contract under the legal architecture even prevails over the Olympic Charter. We've, we need to bring it forward. If, if we've made the commitment from 2024, why wait? You know, and, and clearly that was because that was the next one to go into the bidding process. It applies from them. We certainly need to bring it forward. I actually received a letter this morning from the IOC saying they're accelerating um, their strategy. But it is a long way behind FIFA. Um, and what we've learned with FIFA too is that the process can come to an end. So collective action is important. And from world players' point of view, this just isn't about players. This is about everyone who's involved and affected by sport. Fans, local communities, builders on the construction sites, the children who are affected. Um, it, it really has to be uh, about all of those groups. Great, thanks, Brendan. One of the things we've been talking about on some stuff we're doing on diversity and inclusion that comes up time and time again is also expanding it out to the people who profiteer off sport. It's not only the people who are working in there, the people who build in the community, the helpful people, but the industries that really profiteer off, off the off the off the sport, uh, whether it is the sponsors or you know betting industry, etc. People who really do make quite large sums of money from everyone else doing uh, their jobs. Um, got a couple of questions, speakers. Um, are you okay to hang on for these next two questions? Is it, you're fine. I just I know that you, you said we'll cut off at, uh, at five. So if you are you okay for that? Yeah, great. Okay. So uh, Ilham. Hedrari, um, Iranian resting, he says the Iranian Resting Federation NOC did not play any positive role uh, to save Navid. They are part of the suppressive regime, in his opinion. That's just an observation uh, from him. So, uh, again, that's probably why we need an investigation, or not probably, it's why we need an investigation to identify that and to see whether, where, um, how that could be fixed going forward. Thank you for that. Um, and then finally, we have Kimani Mary. Um, Human Rights OC UN might need to have one unified body specific to sports to deal with the, with less than human treatment for sports people. Cultures, countries around the globe continue various forms of discrimination. Uh, I'm trying to work out what the question was here. As it were, it might only be sports which speaks the apolitical language that all nations might respect. I think it's just, a, 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 I guess, an emphatic point of the bits that have already been raised that sport can go beyond politics in this regard, and that's how powerful it can be. Um, you know, I think sometimes the beauty of sport can be overplayed in terms of uniqueness, but in one area where that it can communicate beyond and above uh, international boundaries. I think you're absolutely right, Kamani. I know that the others have said as much. Now, a final uh, um, question for each of our speakers. If there was or if there is a call to action for everyone listening, both on the webinar today to the podcast, watching the video recording of this, what would it be? What would be the one thing you'd want? Or well, I guess it could be multiple. Rob, do you want to start us off? Thanks, John. The first thing is getting back to our original topic is that we, we continue to have the discussion on what needs to be done um, to really bring forward what's happened to Navid Afkari. His two brothers are still being held um, in, in jail. And I think we need to rally as a community to make sure that changes are, are brought to light and enforced and that Iran does pay the consequences for their actions. And I think the IOC and the Olympic movement must step up to show leadership and to show every athlete that competes in the Olympic games or completes at any level of sport that their rights as humans will be protected and their rights as, as athletes will be protected. And this injustice would never happen again and they would not allow it to happen with other national Olympic committees or other countries. They have an obligation. And the second is, which I've said already, is we need to continue to have discussions. We need to continue to demand change because silence, if, you, if you're silent, you're complicit. And I think moving forward, the more we speak up, I mean, you, you heard from Sally, who has been a champion in the cause and, and bringing truth to power. And if the more Sally's we have, I think the better we'll be off. So continue to have discussion and push for change. Thank you, Rob. Brendan, and I'll come to Sally for the final word. Yeah, I think that's great, Sean. Sally definitely should have the final word because her leadership of this campaign has been, been extraordinary. Um, I was, I've been part of Law and Sports, Sean, because we have lawyers who are part of this group. And, and so my call to action is to the sports law community. 
Um, too often, the practice of sports law is about protecting the sports bodies. Um, sports law has been developed in many ways, not necessarily to protect sport, but to protect the sports bodies. If we look at the abuse of the gymnasts in the United States, for example, we're now seeing an overhaul of the legislation that governs the United States Olympic and Paralympic Committee. Part of the concern that has resulted in that was the sports lawyers and the legal advice to the US OPC all being about denying any liability or responsibility, uh, including uh, US gymnastics in relation to the harm that was caused to the athletes. So the consequence of that was devastating harm on the gymnasts, the bankruptcy of US gymnastics and a congressional overhaul of the US uh, and the US OPC. So sports lawyers have a very big ethical responsibility here. Uh, I call on the sports lawyers to understand that, uh, that protecting sports bodies at the moment is there's a very strong evidentiary basis to show that that is contributing to harm, that there is a better way forward. It's called the Business and Human Rights Framework. It's a proactive due diligence. It's a proactive process of care, of taking into account impacts so that there isn't harm. And uh, sports law can be a force for good, just like sport can be a force for good. But lawyers here, I would encourage them to really review the way in which the profession is being undertaken at the moment. Thank you. Um, and before we come on to Sally, because I really do want to give you the final word. I know that, I don't know if they are athletes or not, but uh, Naveed's brothers, as you said, Rob, are in prison uh, at this moment in time. Is it a reasonable objective that the campaign and lobbying and sanctions against Iran would, would see their release? Or like what, you know, because it just seems to me if we, if we know that his family is still in prison and that they were uh, um, fabricated charges, they would seem, I know that we're talking about the athlete point here, but if we know this, should we not continue to campaign for their release and in some ways to, uh, again, respect and honour Naveed? Sally, maybe you want to address that in your, in your, um, you know, because you're close to this in your final remarks. Yeah, sure. So I would say action items going forward. One, one of the things that our group is pushing for is for Navid and Habib Afkari to have their case re-reviewed. And that's what we're being very vocal about because we know that there's been a miscarriage of justice and let's resolve that. Um, the second thing, and I think this is critical, and I know that there's some athletes, there's some wrestlers on this, and I want you guys to hear that the metal around our neck does not define us. It tells us what we're capable of. And I want you to remember that and to be a voice and a vehicle for change because there is no force more powerful than an athlete who has a voice that has a mission, that has a purpose and wants to use it as a vehicle and a mechanism for good. So whatever your capacity, whether you're a writer, whether you have a voice and you wanna speak or you wanna be in front of the media or behind, we need you and we need for you to find your brothers and sisters, our teammates to come and join this call because human rights, athletes' rights, it's a global issue. And if you're not speaking up, someone's speaking on your behalf, and we want our voices to be heard. Thank you, Sally. Um, 